Welcome to the Get Good at Presenting podcast with Lee Jackson. Hi, welcome back. It's uh, great to... Oh, I'll try that again. Um, <laughs> and hello. Yes, it's me back again, Lee Jackson, on Get Good at Presenting, the podcast, uh, here to really help you to present. And uh, you probably noticed I've had done three or four episodes in this lockdown um, well, partly because we've got time to do it and I've got all the equipment here. And also I'm just here to resource you and to help you because most of you are presenting online using Zoom or Skype or Microsoft Teams or WebEx or something. And so we just want to give you some tips really that would really help you. It doesn't need to be that complicated. Um, and I found a great guest today, uh, Rob Geraghty. Um, hello, Rob. Hi, Nick. Good to be with you. Thanks for coming on board. Um, it was nice of you to come to my house and sit down in my living room. <laughs> if only back in the day, that would have, been, would have been what we were doing. Oh, those were the old days. Do you remember those? Going into rooms, shaking people's hands. But I'm sure we'll get there back soon, Rob. But at the moment, we are virtual um, recording this on Zoom. Um, so, Rob, we, we haven't really properly met. So how did we bump into each other online, I guess, was it? Yeah, I guess so, Lee. It probably would have been, or maybe I come, came across the podcast or online um, on LinkedIn. And um, I do still think you can build friendships and relationships on uh, on these platforms. And again, one of the things I got from the podcast was I felt like I knew you. And um, so, yeah, so it's great to uh, to finally talk. Oh, thanks, Rob. Yeah, I just try and, yeah, I guess what you see is what you get kind of approach. I think people quite like that. There's a lot of presentation skills type podcasts out there but some of them do tend to be I mean that's just their style I'm not having a go at them but they do tend to be a little aloof sometimes a little bit um content high content but quite aloof sometimes and this is not my style so thank you for for noticing that I guess that's why we've connected so that's good the uh, power of LinkedIn I guess there you go so Rob the reason I've asked you first of all tell me a little bit about yourself how did you get into uh, presenting and helping people to present better what was your little journey into that Rob yeah, so if I go back to, uh, I had a corporate career, I worked at Accenture and then at Vodafone. And whilst I was at Vodafone, um, I, I was pretty unhappy age 28 at Vodafone. But the one thing that I enjoyed was giving presentations. And what I started to do at Vodafone was I started to sit down with colleagues and to help them with their presentations. And this wasn't my day job. It wasn't my role. Um, but I'd sit down in the restaurant and look at a presentation with them and help them craft it. And I started to say, wow, I really enjoy this. I wish I could do this full time. Um, and 12 years ago, I left Vodafone. And ever since, I've focused on presentations. Uh, and that's me delivering, going to deliver events, uh, and also me coaching other people. Uh, and I've built a presentation consultancy firm over the last 12 years. And I've just had the time of my life just focusing on, on presentations and helping people to get better at delivering them. That's great. Yeah. So you kind of a little bit like I did, I guess, as a youth worker, I fell into it. I've told that story on a, on a previous podcast and on this new one that I've just advertised um, on a previous one where I've, I've got music and various things. So I, I did talk about my background and yeah, I fell into presenting and enjoyed it probably quite a similar way um, than you really. So yeah, it became something that you enjoyed rather than just telecommunications then. Yeah. And, and, and interestingly for me, I'm really a big introvert and I don't like speaking up when there's lots of people around which sounds like totally the opposite of presenting but what I found was when you gave me the clicker and put me at the front of the room I found my voice um so I really wow. enjoyed that and I can remember my first performance review at Vodafone and my manager saying to me Rob you never speak up in meetings uh, and I didn't I was sitting in a meeting for an hour and say nothing but you said to me right you go and deliver the presentation and I love the preparation process I love standing up there I love people asking me the questions um, so it's a very strange thing that I ended up doing it in a way. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it, there's always a um, always a presumption that a speaker is an extrovert mm. and is a crazy, like egotistical, ex, you know, extrovert that's out there wanting the love of people. And I've obviously met a few people like that, and I'm definitely more extrovert than introvert. But I've got quite an introverted side to me, and I meet more and more presenters that are introverts introverts and so it's not always you know the loudest person in the room is the speaker not at all because yeah. i guess you were quite reflective then in those meetings and stuff were you yeah and I, and i guess um i guess i struggle to find my voice when other people are there and i'm fighting for the attention maybe i think it was partly because i was an only child and i you know i grew up in a household where i didn't have to fight for the attention but of course you put me at the mm. front of the room and you say i'm delivering the presentation and all of a sudden um 
you know, I find that voice and I'm able to, to present. And, and I guess I, you know, I've done more of it. The more I've done of it, I've got better at it. I've got feedback. You know, I've had some great opportunities and, and gone around the world and spoken in different places. So, um, you know, it's been a journey for me just like it is for everybody, Lee. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, we could, we could do a whole series of podcasts on introvert, extrovert. I'm pretty sure that because it's a fascinating subject, isn't it? So. Mm, absolutely. Great. So I, I saw you, uh, you sent me... Um, Details of your webinar. I watched you on your webinar, uh, delivering to a, about twenty people, I think, just giving them some tips on virtual presenting on Zoom and various things. So I thought it'd be great to have you on, Rob, and just maybe give me uh, and my listeners um, your kind of top five tips for people who are at home and having to present um, through Zoom or, or f- f- you know through whatever medium they use. But everyone's got to do it right now. And uh, w- what would be your five? tips to really help people at the moment yeah i think the first one lee is is what i call virtual presence so most presenters know that when you walk in the room or you stand on the stage there's a certain way you should stand you know you you need to present yourself well you need to stand tall um but what i'm fascinated by is so many people seem to forget all of that when they're presenting online so consequently, we see all sorts of things about how people present themselves really badly with the lighting, for example. So I see a lot of people where you just get silhouette and you can't see their face. You've just got the silhouette because they've got <laughs> yeah. the light coming in from behind them. Um, another one of my favorites is the pea head, Lee. Have you ever seen a pea head? You know, when the video <laughs> shot, that you, can see somebody, you can just see their head, but you see 95% <laughs> of their surroundings. I think that people joke that there's speaking to their kind of elderly relatives now. And uh, a lot of elderly relatives, you're either seeing up their nose or just just their fringe. I think, aren't you? That's quite a common thing. I think. Yeah, yeah, but but you know, and I'm talking about corporate business people. I go on lots of calls, and literally the only thing I see from the people at the other end is this little pea head. And I say, look, <laughs> move forward, get closer to the camera, and yeah. you know, you're going to have more presence. Um, just like if you if you present from the back of the stage or you present at the front of the stage, it makes you know you, you look confident and stronger when you get closer to your audience so so do, um, you, th- do you think the p head someone with a really small head in the bottom left hand corner of the screen do you think that is a confidence thing or a technical thing you know i think at times lee people haven't just really thought about this stuff we've just switched the webcam on and and look that is what we do when we ring you know grandparents or or, or speak to family members you know we just switch FaceTime on and i guess what i'm interested in is people who are delivering these important presentations in a professional environment via this virtual medium and i think we've just got to present ourselves more effectively now so um, and you know making sure that we take up more of that space in the camera and uh, lean into the camera so that people can actually see us um, mm. makes all of the difference yeah absolutely so virtual presence i like that so spending a bit of time so uh, what, what would be another tip that you've got rob I think, I think when we're presenting online, we need to be punchier. I think we've got to get to the point quicker. And, you know, I think what might have been delivered as a 45-minute presentation face-to-face, I'd be looking to reduce that in terms of the amount of time. So I think straight to the point, get it over, and then move on. So that webinar, Lee, that you watched, you know, I think there's, uh, there's three sections in there. Each section has got four different points to it. So, uh, you know, somebody could well have come away with 20 points in yeah. just 45 minutes. Um, and that's what people are saying. It's very practical, tangible, you know, and that's, that's what I think people want online. Mm. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that I'm sort of hearing the end of, uh, I mean, we've used the word webinar today, but I'm hoping that the word webinar starts to disappear because... Oh, yeah. Because yeah. for me, webinar is 1990s, uh, early 2000s, someone talking through their bullet points. That's what a webinar uh, so that appears to me. So I think of, you know, a virtual or remote speaking is a more helpful phrase than webinar, don't you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm desperately searching for a better phrase than webinar. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, because, I, I, again, I clicked on something the other day because, again, I, I watch webinars for fun just to see what people are doing. And, and it was one slide with the logo of the organization with a voice in the background. And I, obviously I didn't watch the whole of it, but it was an hour and 32 minutes of that. And I'm just like, well, if that, you know, even if that's the most compelling content in the world by the best speaker in the world, I don't know whether it's going to keep me engaged. So yeah. 
It's really tough. I, I want a new word for them, Lee. So let me know when you come up with something. <laughs> We'll, we'll think of one at the end of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. It's really tricky, isn't it? But the um, I was speaking to uh, one of my clients yesterday, a very large organization, and they've been wanting me to teach stuff around webinars because they wanted to do particularly sort of induction training, the kind of mandatory type stuff. You know, they want to do that online, basically. But the engagement levels are just through the floor when you do it in that kind of old style, really. So yeah, I love the idea of being punchier. So get your virtual presence, number one. Number two, be punchier. And yeah, let's not do an hour's talk. Let's get to the point and cut to the chase a little quicker. That's great. Number three, what have we got, Rob? I think be conversational. So I'm moving to a conversational style of presenting. So again, I think Lee, you're highlighting it before. You know, old school presentations to me is lecture. You know, I talk and then at the end we go, any questions? So conversational style means um, that after three or four minutes, I'll come to the audience, you know, and I, I will get people, I'll pull people in. I use people's names. I'll say, Lee, I'm going to come to you for a view on this. Tell me about what you had, on, had for breakfast this morning. And I actually pull people in and hear the views of the audience. So, yeah. and it also, I guess it means that I can be far more dynamic in what I'm delivering and I'm starting to deliver what the audience want, not what I pre-prepared and what I want to deliver to them. Um, and obviously there's a balance to that. Lee. It's not, not as straightforward as just being totally driven by the audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In my, in my, uh, when I've delivered, you know, an in-person presentation skills day, uh, I always set people to do a, you know, several presentations throughout the day and they usually get to do one towards the end of the day. And some people who are really nervous, what they'll do is they'll turn a talk into a conversation, mm -hmm. which is not what I was looking for. But I understand because what they'll do is to get out of planning anything. They'll just they'll just say, um, anyone, you got any ideas about this? Or yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's not what you're talking about. You're on about giving a short, a bit, a bit of content and then immediately flipping it over to Janet, is that, is that, does that resonate with you or John? What do you, you know, that kind of thing, yeah? Absolutely. So, you know, maybe I'm doing it in three or four minute bursts. I give you something, I give you an idea, then I go to the audience and get some reactions and thought from them. Um, and again, you know, when we're talking online, again, something we use a lot of is, it depends on your audience size, bigger audience, use the chat and have a host in there that's monitoring the chat and that can chime in and say, oh, Rob, there's a really interesting question come up on that point that you just made. Um, <laughs> And again, I just think presentations virtually, and maybe this is another tip, Lee, is that they shouldn't be delivered on your own. You know, you should have a, a host, a second presenter. You know, exactly. again, why does, this, why does this podcast work for us? Because it's you and me backwards and forwards. If this yeah. was just me on my own talking for 20 minutes, it wouldn't be as engaging as hearing the conversation. Um, so having a, a co-host, having a second presenter, I think is a yeah. great thing to do on a virtual presentation. Um, yeah, and I'm always right. thinking about Anton Deck and Phil and Kirsty. You know, <laughs> could Ant present on his own? Yes, but Anton Deck becomes a dynamic, and and, and something works off it. And certainly, something we've experienced. We had a lot of feedback recently that having a host just brings a different dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. And the host actually could be someone who's maybe not as confident as presenting, but it can be someone that you're training, someone that you're working with. It could indeed be a very shy, introverted person who can read and then just chip in occasionally. So it's beautiful for teams, isn't it? Because someone might not want to run the whole thing, but actually they'll they'll happily chip in and monitor things for you. So it's, it's a good for a team organization thing, isn't it? Yeah, but equally it could work the other way around, Lee. So the host could be the sales director and then, you know, the, ah. the main presenter might be the two salespeople. But, you know, what you, you could got some confidence that you've got your sales director in the room who might be able to ask the answer the really tough question that comes up. So, oh, very good. Um, you know, it can work the other way around. So Yeah, I, I, I saw a big uh, Zoom. I was on a big Zoom call a few weeks ago and the person ended up was doing, it was the first one that they'd done and they were so stressed out because they were doing everything. So they were muting and unmuting people on Zoom. They were reading the chats they were doing. And I think they had to go and lie down in a darkened room afterwards. So yeah. the next time they did it, they immediately got uh, another one or two people to help them out. And that changed everything. So I mean, that, that point about muting and unmuting, one of the key things that we do, because again, it's one of my bugbears. You go on a call and they say, can everybody please mute themselves? That's like saying to your audience, right, can you shut up and don't ask, don't ask me anything? <laughs> um, so, so don't say, please mute yourselves. What we say is we request, we say, look, 
go and find where mute is, learn how to switch it on and off. And we're really, in a way, we're teaching our audience how to be an audience and how to do it. Um, and often when I reach out to people, I say, Lee, we're going to come to you with this next question. And I will say, just unmute yourself, Lee. And, and then I say what the question is. So I'm giving people right. time to do that. But educating the audience. And look, I think in 12 months' time, people are going to be, audience are going to be more familiar with these platforms. And therefore, they're going to be able to do more of this stuff themselves. But we're always going to find people who don't know how to do it. Yeah, the, yeah, that's a good point. So in effect, you're teaching them at the beginning, this is where mute is, this is where your camera is, yeah, do all those kind of things. So yeah, that's really good. I like, I like the idea. And I guess Lee, I'd even go as far as maybe even recording a video and putting some of that stuff in there. Yeah. You might send out to people before. And look, it totally depends on the situation, but um, yeah. you could easily put some of that into a, a short video and say, look, guys, jump on Zoom if you're using that beforehand, learn how to do these things. Um, so that you make the most out of the experience of, of what happens yeah. when you come on the platform. Yeah, absolutely. Because people are playing catch up, aren't they? And um, uh, I had a friend of mine and she was uh, arranging arrange to get on a call and she realized that there was no webcam on a laptop because uh, yeah. <laughs> it had broken or whatever, or it was an old one or whatever. And But she'd never had to use it before. So she never bothered, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was like, oh, right, yeah. So everyone's playing catch up. Everyone's trying to think, oh man, has my has my computer got the right stuff? So, so I don't know whether we're on, th- are we on three or four. I don't know. What's your next tip, Rob? Anyway, I'm lost there. But build it on what you said then, Lee. I just say also, you know, get online first. Switch your, you know, again, I'm yeah. thinking about in Zoom, but this could be any platform. I often open another meeting, not the meeting I'm going into, but another meeting, just so I can open the video and I can just look. How do I look in the video? Oh, there's that ridiculous thing in the background. So I jump into another meeting, check all that out, and then um, and then I'm ready to go onto the main meeting. So yeah, so open. Yeah, so I, I I've been messing about with green screens and all sorts of things this week and different backdrops that I've got, um, and I've got ones built into my office here, but I've also got other ones I've been playing with. So yeah, I've spent <laughs> I've spent half the week this week having Zoom calls with myself. Yeah, to, yeah. Uh, really, really interesting. Colors. Great guy, Lee Jackson, though. You can <laughs> talk to yourself and make perfect sense. So, yeah. um, look, <laughs> ne- next, next tip, Lee, is um, about materials. And okay. it's really, really interesting to see how people share materials on these platforms. And what, what I'm interested in is the fact that, you know, if we'd have been in the room with people and we say, what's more important, the presenter or the slides? Most people yeah. will generally say, Look, presenter comes first and the slides are the backup support to the presenter. Yeah. But what's interesting with these platforms is that when you hit share screen and share slides, they make the slides go really big, 90% of the screen. They make the video feed go really small. Yeah. And I just think that's the wrong way around. So (laughs) I'm just saying to people, look, be really careful and mindful of what you're sharing. Because again, I've been on so many presentations where we're now having a discussion about, you know, something, but the slides are still up there and we can't actually see yeah. each other because the slides are dominating. Um, so just remember the role of slides is they're the backup support. They're the best supporting actor. They are not the main yeah. thing themselves. Yeah. So in my talks, and I'll probably mention in previous podcasts, I talk about the slides being the backdrop to your message. Yeah. It's, it's signage. It's a backdrop. It's it's you know if you're talking about mountains, have a mountain behind you. It's it's not the focus of your talk because you as a presenter are the focus. Yeah. Which is always difficult when when uh, people when event organizers contact me, they say, "Can you send me your presentation?" And I very carefully uh, say to them, um, "I can't send you the presentation because I'm the presentation." Yeah. Uh, do you mean my slides kind of thing? And I do it very nicely. I'm not, I'm not being uppity about it, but I'm trying to teach them that the slides are not the presentation. Yeah. And so, so, uh, so I'm not certainly we're using zoom at the moment. There is some little tweaks you can do to reduce the size of the slides, isn't there? Do you want to mention those Rob? Yeah. So, um, but again, the difficult thing Lee is that I've got to tell the people in my audience to do this. So, um, uh, when I am sharing the slides, somebody who's, who's viewing those, can choose to change to side-by-side mode. And yeah. Once they choose side-by-side mode, they then get a slider and they could then make the video 80% big and the slides 20%. Or they could have 50-50 or they could have 60-40. They've got control of that. 
And again, I think it's one of the really difficult things about virtual presenting is I don't really know what's going on at your end because you could be on a Mac and you've not gone full screen or you're on a, a phone. Mm. So the difference at your end is, you know, and this is where I think we need to educate our audiences so that they can turn up set up to have the best possible experience of receiving our message. I see. So how, uh, what do they need to do to, to engage side by side mode? What do they need to do in zoom, for example? So in zoom, uh, literally when you are viewing someone else's slides, there's a drop down button of options that's available and yeah. choose side by side. So it's really simple to do. Yeah. But most people won't know that it's there and they'll just go on with the slides being really big and the video being tiny. Oh, it's, it's in the preferences as well. You've got preferences, share screen, uh, and just click, and the side-by-side -side mode is an option. Um, another little tweak I've noticed with Zoom particularly is that if I use a Mac, and if you, do, if you go full screen on the Mac, you know, you know, you know so it, it covers the whole screen, it, it changes some of the chat options. Mm -hmm. but, it, but if you leave it fairly full screen, but not fully full screen, if you know what I mean, you seem to have easier chat options. It's got some weird things when it goes full screen. So um, I fill the screen, but I don't put it into proper full screen mode um, because the chat and the participation options can come in the right hand side uh, so you can see what everyone's doing and chatting about. Um, I find that it doesn't do that very well, weirdly, on full screen mode. I don't know why that is, but there you go. Little bits of software. Yeah, absolutely. And again, this is what we've all got to do is, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's just get really comfortable with the platforms that we're using yeah. and know how to use them. And um, sure, you know, right? And, you know, it's a bit like. So have you got any of the tips, or, or was that was that the lot? I think that was it. Was it? You know, let me just one final thing. I just wanted right. to say, Lee, was just vi you know, let's get people to get their video on because again, I just uh -huh. think this is where we connect is when video is on. And I hear so many excuses, oh, I've just been for a run or the room's a mess in the background. And, you know, we all know the reality everyone's facing at the moment is people are working from home from back bedrooms. But, you know, if I can see that you've got a picture of Man United in the background and I'm a Man United fan, then that might well bring us together. Um, okay. you know, I think we've got to just roll with that. But the connection mm -hmm. happens when we can see each other. Um, so... Yeah, okay. so whether you do backdrops or whether you do live, but um, I, I, a nice tip, I think, is that just keep one part of your room tidy. Yeah. So my office is a mess at the moment. It needs a good tidy up. So it's a bit of a bomb site, but where the, where the camera is, I can spend 30 seconds and it's fairly tidy. So if you, all you need is just the camera width of tidiness, basically. Yeah. And the and rest yeah, of the room. I've, I've got a term for you that um, uh, one of my uh, colleagues who's based out in Dubai gave me this term. Uh, Wendy Shaw came up with the, the term the Zoom zone. So oh, I like that. The Zoom zone is that area in your office that you know exactly where um, you are well set up for, <laughs> for doing your virtual presentations. Mm. And then the other tip that goes on top of that, then, Lee, is take a, a photograph of your Zoom zone. Because yeah. if you've got a photograph and you found yourself presenting from somewhere else, you could use your photograph of your Zoom zone as a virtual background. And to everybody watching, it looks like you're back in that familiar place. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's a backdrop you can use as a virtual backdrop, but it's still your backdrop by taking a picture of it. I like exactly. that. And, and let's say you've set it up once, Lee, you've got it all super tidy. It's all perfect. Yeah. Take the photograph. The next day you happen to have the washing in the background. <laughs> You can put the, the virtual background on there, you know, and mm. then people don't see the washing. So, again, that's a really nice way to uh, – because that, that's one practical way of these virtual backgrounds rather than just mm. doing it for the fun of looking like I'm in San Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> which is – everyone's got the San Francisco bridge on, haven't they? And um, – but <laughs> the uh, the other thing is that you, you could also play a brilliant game of spot the difference, couldn't you? So – you could put a virtual background on and then flick to the new one and you could move things around. You know, you could do it as an icebreaker. They've got all sorts of options there. And I think what, what you're showing, Lee, is one of the last things I wrote down was just we need to be creative and we need to think. You know, I really believe that virtual presentations can be a fantastic experience. Great. But we also all know that we've been to virtual presentations that have been a rubbish experience. And if we get creative and we really think about it, then we can create that really great engaging experience that people would get face-to-face -face from us being in the room with them.
Yeah. And that's what makes a difference. Because ultimately, we're, we're in the business of communication. We're in the business of changing behaviors, making more profit, changing people's lives, encouraging them. And that just needs to happen. So we need to, like we do when we're presenting, we need to get rid of the distractions. So when I work in large organizations, people have uh, ID badges and lanyards around their neck. And I say to them, when you're presenting, take your lanyard off. And they go, oh, no, I'm not allowed to do that. No, seriously, when you're presenting, take your lanyard off because you want as little distractions for the audience as possible. So the equivalent with the virtual stuff is just get that stuff right. What's the equivalent of the lanyard of the badge that will get in the way? Because when someone has a lanyard on, I'm staring at the lanyard thinking, oh, they've got a funny, you know, they've got a funny middle name. I can't quite, what department are they in? And I'm looking at the badge rather than concentrating on the presenter. And um, we just need to do that, you know, just take away the distractions and stuff. Um, well, my confession, Lee, uh, last, last big presentation I did, uh, a closing keynote, which I did uh, just two weeks before coronavirus hit, um, yeah. my shirt button, my bottom shirt button popped on the day, like an hour before I was due to present. I didn't have another shirt with me. So I said, can I wear my lanyard? Because I think it's going to cover it up. So for the first time ever in my life, I presented with lanyard to try to uh, compensate for my wardrobe malfunction, shall we say. Oh, very good. Yeah, I mean, I even empty my pockets when I'm presenting, uh, like in-person presenting. It's weird because I don't want my wallet or my phone or tissues or anything in my pocket. I just empty my pockets. Little things like that are distractions. So let's go through what you've said. Some been great tips there that people can um, really help them with. So um, have a virtual presence or so work on your virtual presence like you would in person. Be punchier, be conversational. Think about having a host or a co-host that can help you and uh, do a little test meeting with yourself. Prepare yourself beforehand and then share good materials and slides, but do that side by, in side-by-side -side mode and don't let the slides be the presentation. Is that a pretty good summary you think Rob? yeah and lee i hear all that back and i sort of think well isn't a lot of that similar to what we would have been doing face to face and of course it yeah. is and you know and, and again i think this is a message for people is look trust that 80 percent of this stuff is the same um we've just got to tweak the 20 percent. so um you know so if you've got skills yeah. if you are a speaker you're regularly presenting well look that's not gone away has it those abilities haven't gone away <laughs> so um you know, I know there's a big change here for a lot of people, but um, but it is very possible. That's great. So, Rob, how can people find you and get hold of you? Lee, the only place to find me is on LinkedIn. So if people want to connect with me, search cool. Rob Geraghty on LinkedIn and um, you can uh, put my name in there so that people can find me. Um, right. And uh, yeah, how do you spell your name? It's G-E-R-A-G-H-T-Y. It's a good Irish name. My, uh, I would say my cousin is Barry Geraghty, the jockey. Same, yeah. uh, same Garrity. So great. Thank you so much, Rob. Thanks, Lee. Great to talk to you. Bye bye. So I hope you enjoyed that podcast uh, with Rob. If you'd like to get in touch with me directly, please do. The details are coming up in just a moment. And if I can help you at all, uh, of course, with your remote, virtual, or in person presenting, just give me a shout. Always happy to help. Always happy to quote you for the right session to help you and your workplace to be the best presenters they can be. Cheers now. Stay safe. Thanks for listening to the Get Good at Presenting podcast with your host, Lee Jackson. If you'd like to know more about Lee's work as a motivational keynote speaker and presentation coach, visit his website at leejackson.biz. That's leejackson.biz. 